So yes, like Jesse said, I'm Shannon and I work for the Value Added Ag Office um, on campus. Um, and so you might have questions about what Value Added Ag is, maybe not, but um, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so the Value Added Ag Office on campus has a, lot, a variety of different programs. Um, and one being the Agricultural Marketing Resource Center, um, which is a national information resource for value added, value added agriculture, which you might wonder what the heck that is. But um, the goal of my talk today is to just not give you ev what, there, what everything you need to know about grants are, it's to get you thinking about it. So we just spent this whole morning about different types of maple product or how to produce maple syrup. Um, but this is just to get you to think about some other ways to maybe make turn this into a business. Um, so just by a raise of hands, how many of you have ever applied either maybe through work or maybe for your maple products ever applied for a grant? Anyone? Okay, it's kind of what I thought. So I guess what are you, what is your perception? Uh, is it kind of like this when you think about grants? Well, um, it's not actually, that would be false. Um, in reality, only 10% of grants are actually funded. Um, that's when you th put all grants in together. I think when you think about agriculture, it's a little bit better than 10%. I would almost guarantee that. Um, but just, we're gonna get into some, to some grant 101 here, um, since a variety of you might have, just to get you thinking about it. So. <clears throat> So unlike what that picture said, grants are not free money and they should only be sought after um, with an idea in mind. Um, and usually if you get, get money, there's probably some sort of um, thing you have to do back to them, so to that funding source. Um, so if you have a, an idea or something you wanna pursue um, and you are looking for grants, um, you should have a purpose for, for whatever you're doing. You should not go, oh, I found a grant, let's throw something together so we can just get some free money to do this. That's not how they work and the granting agency will mm -hmm. probably pick that through your application. So <clears throat> when you have an idea, um, you're gonna probably look on the internet or some, something and there's gonna be what's called a request for proposal. And these are kind of like the Bible for that particular grant. So if it says in your grant application you need, you need this, this, and this, plus three letters of support. You don't want to be that overachiever and submit four letters of support because most grant, <clears throat> grant applications are so competitive that just by not following directions could get your grant application disqualified. So just think about those and um, follow with what it says. Um, and then <clears throat> there's going to be different requirements that you're going to have to fulfill if you are applying for a grant, whether it be some sort of outreach activity. Um, so that could be if you're a producer, you could probably contact Jesse and say, I'm going to apply for this grant. I need to do some sort of field day. Can you help me with that? And he would tell you yes, because um, that's what we do in Extension. We are a resource and, um, to, for educational pro programming. There might be other um, types of requirements like cash matches. Um, <coughs> grants vary on depending what you're applying for, but sometimes for every $1, for example, of grant funding, you have to put up $1 of your own. So just think about that when you're looking. Um, and then my last point on this slide, just as an overview of grants, is the value of working together. And I kind of mean a, a few different things by this. So. Um, I mentioned that you should have a purpose um, for the funds. So you probably have something that you're trying to solve because grant funds generally aren't gonna give you um, startup funds to put in taps or things like that. That's gonna be your own skin in the game. Um, so your grant funds are probably gonna be towards solving something. Maybe you've had taps, tap trees for 10 years and you always have the same problem and you have an idea on how to make it better. So the value of working together is Maybe that guy next to you has the same problem and you can work together. Um, so there's a validity in working together is what I'm trying to say. And also um, there's people like myself, there's people, other people in extension, USDA, um, that 
are putting out these grants and helping people with grants that they want you to come to them and that chances are they know what these granting agencies are looking for. So seek those people out, seek help, um, and that's what we're here for, I guess. <clears throat> so like I said, I work for the Ag Marketing Resource Center. Um, so if you are kind of like a hobby producer, I mean that in a good way, um, and are looking to maybe turn this into a business, we have a lot of resources on business development. Um, when you start doing your financial, financial sheets, things like that, we have a lot of resources. Um, and then we're especially busy when it's, <coughs> excuse me, when it's, um, when there is a value-added producer grant um, available. So I'm not sure if you've heard of value-added producer grants, but um, the goal is to uh, generate new products and expand markets to increase producer income. So there's one of two types of grants that you would be applying for if you are applying for a value-added producer grant. And one being a planning grant, which you would use to then um, uh, do a feasibility study or business plan. And what I mean by that is, um, let's say, like a speaker earlier this morning said, we should look, be looking into Des Moines or Iowa City markets. So let's say you're a producer here and you want to look into selling your maple products in Des Moines. Um, before applying for the working capital grant, which I'll expand on in a little bit, um, you would have to... Um, it would be a good idea to make sure that your product would sell in Des Moines. So you would apply for funds to have a third party person do a, a feasibility study. Um, and it just valid validates your business um, and just make sure that you're gonna be successful. Um, so with that being said, uh, the working capital would be the other one. And this can be um, used to operate your value added business. So this is up to $250,000. I will say um, that if you are applying for less than $50,000 in working capital, um, or let me rephrase that, if you are <clears throat> seeking more than $50,000 in working capital funds, you would have already needed to do a planning or a feasibility study. So that's the great thing about the Value Added Producer Grant is it encourage you, encourages you to stair step. So do a planning grant first, make sure you have a market for your product, and then come back a year later and apply for working capital funds. And then if you wanna expand your different products, you can continue to do that same process over and over again. So you're really utilizing grant funds to then make your, expand your business more and more. Um, and then this one does a one-to-one -one match. Um, and so, Back to the value added question. Um, the top three, I think, maybe top three in the second from the bottom one kind of really apply to value added maple products. So when we're talking about value added pr products, we're talking about um, commodity processing. So you're taking, for example, these are um, projects that have been funded in the past. So they took the wheat and made it into flour. So it's a process where you can't convert it back to the original state. Um, market differentiation, if you had organic grass-fed beef, um, that would be a value-added product. Commodity segregation, GMO-free as opposed to GMO. Um, and then local food, so buy fresh, buy local type things. So those are the kind of things you, when we talk about value-added products that we're talking about. And so I could stand up here and tell you more, but I think I learned best by example, and so I think that this short video will help you understand what you can use a value added producer grant for. Let's see. Do you have to press play, Jesse, maybe? Locally processed 
dry aged, black Angus beef. Um, I have always had success in the retail business, previously uh, mostly working for other people, and uh, Kirk has always been in the cattle business, and uh, with the markets the way that they were, uh, we decided to try our hand at our own retail business and add value to the product that he was raising. We were able to use the value added producer grant in a lot of different ways. Um, one, we were able to purchase signs both down on the road and uh, here at the store to direct people uh, into our business. We were able to use it for advertising, to educate our uh, consumers as far as what we were doing, and um, we were able to buy equipment such as a digital scale and things that we needed to make our business run efficiently. The Value Added Producer Grant gave us an opportunity to expand our business without going further into debt uh, to do that. Because of the grant money, we were able to um, take a hold of opportunities that we otherwise would not have been able to afford. When you hear about a grant, do your research and um, don't let the process uh, scare you. You know, um, the, the language of grants can be a little bit daunting, but that's what your USDA representatives can help you with. When you've been uh, given a grant, use that funding for things that are going to help your business in the long run. Um, our signs, for example, is something, you know, we put them in, I think, in 2011, and obviously they're still um, driving business to us. So I think Jolene hit on a lot of points that I had previously said. Um, so that, I don't want to go too much into detail about value added producer grants because it's a beast of itself, but does anyone have any questions um, based on that information that I can help answer for you before I move on to another grant? Where do you start the process? So um, the, what we tell people is, um, in each state, there's a USDA Rural Development Office, um, and then probably in whatever part of the state you are, there is a more local um, person. And if you had an idea, we would, and I can get your information and um, give you the contact information for um, them, but you would reach out to your rural develop, USDA Rural Development Specialist, and they would help you with anything that you had. Um, um, and then they would be that contact person going forward. Um, our office at Iowa State actually does feasibility studies. Um, we could help with that, uh, but your USDA person will be a huge help with you through this process because it is a daunting, like she said. But there's people and resources out there for you. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. I think so. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, Iowa is pretty well known for getting value added producer grants because our rural development specialists um, really are out in the field and helping people. Um, and then, so it's a national program. There's 18 million right now. There um, is a grant proposal out. Um, and uh, there's a certain allotted amount allocated towards different states and then if there's any left over they kind of um, they try to go and get more money to bring in so Iowa and I'm not sure about Wisconsin and Illinois but um, Iowa is pretty well known at going out and getting more funding um, so the next um, grant opportunity so th the first one the value added producer grants are kind of for marketing um, and expanding your business kind of thing but the SARE program is a little bit different, um, kind of uh, just do on, like on farm in your woodlands, things like that kind of um, problem solving. So I'm not the expert in this. My colleague, Linda Navis, she's the SARE coordinator for Iowa. Um, and SARE is another USDA funded program, sustainable agriculture research and education program. And um, like I said, an another short video, just because I think it will do a much better job than I can. It's only about a minute.
So you probably noticed in the video um, that there is a SAIR model and Linda likes to explain it like a three-legged stool. If you, have, if you don't have one, you're going to fall over um, and you're not going to be successful. So they really focus and su successful SAIR grantees um, follow these three things. Stewardship of our nation's land and water, profit over the long term, and quality of life for farmers, ranchers, and their communities. Um, so uh, there are a variety of grant programs offered through the SARE program. And um, the unique thing about them is they include um, stakeholder involvement. So these are things that researchers and farmers and producers all over the United States, they are um, they are actively involved and they see that there's a problem and there's a way that they think that they can do it better. So they apply for a grant, you know, like we talked about earlier, they had a purpose for the funds. They apply for a grant um, to do research on farm. Um, so that's kind of unique. And then a lot of times um, they have different field days and things like that to then bring in other producers of the same kind. Um, so I'm gonna guess by, 90% of you, if you were to apply for a SARE grant, be most likely be a farmer rancher grant. Um, so they're competitive grants um, who are exploring sustainable solutions um, through research demonstration, educational product projects. Um, so these are a little bit smaller grants. Um, if you are a um, one producer, I think it's $7,500. If you had um, a neighboring farmer, a producer, it would go up to 15,000, but there aren't any matching funds, um, but they do require some sort of outreach activity. So a lot of times there are um, field days and things like that, that extension idols um, uh, or organizations can help put on. Um, and then SARE's also, oh, so, and SARE grants, so grants aren't open all the time. There's typically a small window, six to eight weeks typically, where a grant is open. Um, and usually this is what it is for farmer rancher grants. So you'll see that one is due next December and it'll probably be this, it will be a similar um, format for next year. So if you have an idea and it's too late right now, next year you might be able to. Um, and I did ask Linda, what is, uh, you know how I said 10% of grants are funded and I asked about the farmer rancher grant and um, she said 40 to 50% typically. Um, and that brings up a good point. So Linda is the state SAIR coordinator um, and for any grant there is a grant coordinator and if you have an idea for, an, a grant, for a grant and you're looking into applying for one, contacting that person is one of the most important things you can do because most people, if you give them enough time, will review your grant proposal prior to submission and give you pointers on what you need to fix. So definitely do that and they're super willing to work with you. So keep that in mind and it helps your chances, obviously, of getting the grant. Um, so SARE has a variety of other <clears throat> resources listed on their website. Um, SARE has been around since 1988 and all of the projects um, reports are listed on the website. So even if you didn't want to apply for a grant, but you are, like you are, um, looking into maple syrup or already doing that, you could go in and search their database and see what research projects have been done to maybe help yourself out in any way and just 
um, learn more about what maybe problems you might be running into and how people thought they could solve it and if they did. Um, if you have a similar project that you want to do, um, they don't frown upon applying for the same type of project. They just ask you to expand on it in some way, improve it, how you did things and things like that. But you want to reference that previous project in your grant proposal to prove that you have done your research. Um, if you are just looking into um, looking into different grants, SARE, even if it's not for a SARE grant, has a variety of grant resources just to look in. And, um, so this, so they always have an example of a request for a pr proposal out there. So you can kind of see what is typical, um, as well as um, they have a request for a proposal. Oh, and so for each different grant that they have on there. So you could go in there and see what's, let's say your busy season is normally when um, the application or the request for proposals is out. You could go in there and get what you need and then when it actually comes out, you could be almost ready to go so you could submit it. Um, and then one last thing, I don't have a slide on it, but um, if you, uh, Sarah has a variety of books and publications that they have put out, so if you are looking into other types of, if you have a small farm or um, maybe a larger farm, um, they just have a variety of resources that you can use to look, um, ex better your farm. Um, and then other resources, like again, like I said, I just wanted to get you thinking about different types of programs that are out there for you. Um, so your USDA, NRCS people would be great people to contact, what can I do, what can I, what kind of projects would I apply for? Um, and then state and county pro programs, it kind of varies where you are and what your county is doing, but there might be some sort of funds um, that are available for beginning farmers or things like that. And then your local economic development might have some sort of program as well. Um, and with that, I guess, is there any questions that I can help with? I think most people, when they think about grants, it's a daunting experience, but um, there really are resources out there. You just got to reach out, um, and we can help you with that. So. Right. So if, if we were to set up a cooperative where we would all bring, like a, a grain elevator, we mm -hmm. bring stuff to get dry from that. Right. So the value added producer grant, I didn't go into a whole bunch of detail about who can apply for that, but there is a section of that or who is applicable to apply, and they would be cooperate, or like a co op setting. So you could have um, grower or producers in this room that would be an option. So we c you can contact us and we can just give you an idea of how that will work. Um, when you are, uh, when you think about that, I think there's a stipulation where you, the owner or the members of that cooperative have to be the producers, but in your case you would be. So, but there are, there are options for those things. Right. And equipment costs. I mean, or is it a call? You know, do I have to bring an account that shows I got seventy-five thousand in cash? Right. So it all depends. But I know for the value-added producer grant, up to fifty percent of the match funds can be your sweat equity, so your labor or your immediate family, not other workers, that, but immediate family employees could have sweat equity, and that would could be up to fifty percent of the match. So not the the one to one, but 50% of the match, yeah. So there are um, options like that. So it doesn't have to be monetary, 